the cover of your book, you have a tree. And you <laughs> mentioned the scripture about how we are known as mighty oaks of righteousness. Why is the oak tree important and how it relates to us? Well, the oak tree is, is not only the Bible several times, but it's also the national tree of America and many other countries. And it represents that strength that firmly planted the pillars of society, all of those things. And when you look at the oak tree, and I, I'll put it here, I'm sure you guys put it up on the screen. Mm -hmm. But when, it, when you see the oak tree, it also, this tree also looks like a brain. Because to be an oak tree in society right now, we have to have the mind of Christ, but not just like theoretically. We have to be able to perceive his thoughts about political decisions, whether you're an independent, whether you're a Democrat, whether you're a Republican in America, you have to think with God about different things that are happening because there's still a lot of old baggage and mindsets in those political parties. We have to think with God right now to say, you want to bring a new revolution. And as we're like aligned with God in a season that everything that can be shaken will be shaken. We're seeing that everything's being shaken. I've never been in a season like this. I've had so many people in my life tell me a new crisis almost every day, not every week, not every month, every day there's a new crisis, whether it's weather or, or health or, you know, political or whatever. And so, so because I, when we're aligned with him and we share his perceptions, we become rooted and grounded, unshakable to the world around us. And people begin to look at us. It may happen in marriages and family, which is one of God's great designs that's going to restore us back into his original intention. When people see what a father and a mother and children look like and it's healthy and it's in process and vulnerable and the reality of it, they get saved because they see the connected family that they belong to in heaven. And so even that can be an Oaks of Righteousness experience where you start to operate not as a normal family, but as a family that's in process and vulnerable to change and adapt and grow in love. And when you see that, like we have people in our family, my parents were first generation Christians and people get saved just by you know, watching us do life. And I mean, one lady got saved while we were fighting in the car on the way to church. And my mom was bringing her with us. And she was saying it was so beautiful because it was the first fight she saw that didn't have divorce on the table or where our hearts were still loving each other. And she'd only fought in a way that was breaking up relationship. We were just arguing over where to go to lunch and she, on the way to church. Yes, we did. And she was, you know, she was so impacted by her love for each other in the midst of arguing that she, she said, I need to know Jesus. This is the first time I knew that he's real because you truly love each other, even in the midst of fighting isn't evil for you. It's, you know, we're like, yeah, it is. But, you know, she, she saw a different level. And people need to see that rootedness in the love of God, that rootedness in our mind and the way we operate and, and pivot because he's speaking to us and he's showing us how to walk. You know, Sean, I have two quick questions here that I want to ask you. Uh, one is, out of all of your encounters, which one was the most life transformative in your own world? And then also, did you do anything to kind of perpetuate those encounters? Or is there, there may be people watching right now that want to have that type of encounter. Is there anything that we can do to position ourselves to receive from God that type of an encounter? Yeah, I'll, I'll answer the second one first, which is I think almost everybody who's impacting the world right now in Christianity has had an encounter. And I now have a podcast exploring series for the marketplace and for just every day-to-day -day people. And I'll have politicians, venture capitalists, all these people, most of them are outside the church. And I'll ask them, what brought you, the story behind it, what brought you to the place where you have this career? And they'll talk about the encounter. So I've surrounded myself for decades now, interviewing people, hearing like, how did God do this in you or through you? And when you hear the story, it makes you say like Habakkuk, Lord, me too. I said it all in it of your fame of what you've done through their life and their life, but I have to have this in my life. So it says, bless are the hungry in this very first sermon for they'll be feel, filled. So I got real hungry. And I think that that was the catalyst. He wanted it more than I did, but he wanted me to be hungry for it. And so I think just surrounding yourself with stories of how God's changed the world and areas that you want to see change in your world, I think is really important. And there's shows like this and 700 Club and there's podcasts like mine, the Exploring Series. There's, there's ways to do it through media. There's lots of YouTube videos from curated by safe groups. And I think that that's so important. And then the second thing, the first question you ask, I think... Um, Oh, oh my gosh, I lost track of it because I was so excited about the second question. What, what was there the most life transformative encounter oh, of, that yes. you've had in all of them that you've written about in the book? I would say those encounters all together are the most impactful, but there was one specifically that changed kind of a performance issue in me where I saw Satan take Jesus to the top of the temple to tempt him. And he already had the temple, so he took him there and showed him the world and he showed him culture and he showed him everything else and said, you can have all this and all, it's fast track. You don't have to pay the price God's trying to ask you to pay. You don't have to do what he's asking. I will give you the ability to change everything the way you want to form it if you'll just do it through me instead of through God. And he 
it was a deceiver. So, I mean, there wasn't truth in it. He wasn't going to give him, and he didn't even have the power to give him that. But I could imagine how Jesus was tempted by that to do everything now. Like, I don't have to go through three more years. I don't have to die on the cross because he knew some of those things were going to happen. And I feel like for us to watch Jesus overcome that and just say, there's no way and quote scripture, there's something inside of us that I feel like the enemy tries to get us to bypass the process of God in our life because we want a God result that doesn't come from our own human effort, talent, skill, you know, education. We want a God result that takes us past what we could perform out of our own humanity. And I think in that moment when I saw Jesus say, no, I'm going to go God's way, that, forget you. This is like God's going to give it to me in the fullness of what I already had. I didn't, I, I gave up what I had for humanity, but God's way, not my way. And I feel like that surrender, I came into a place of surrender. And I feel like that's really ministered to a lot of the community of friends and people that I've talked to is that they've been able to come into a place of surrender to say, okay, God, I'll take your process. Even though you're going to lead me in ways I don't want to go sometimes, I'm going to obey you.